Kicking off the list at number 10, got a passport. Ramses II is known as one of the greatest ancient Egyptian rulers of all time. He was called Ramses the Great, so that's a good sign already. At a young age, he fought in harsh battles to protect the borders of Egypt, and during his reign, the Egyptian army reached 100,000 men. That's a pretty large army. He was later referred to as the Great Ancestor, and it didn't take long for Ramses II to declare himself a god. It's always fun being like, hey, by the way, I'm a god now. That's how cool I am. 30 years into his ruling, Ramses was ritually turned into an Egyptian god. It was a formal thing. Though it wasn't until 3,000 years later until Ramses would truly soar through the skies. He was buried in his treasure after 96 years of living, and in 1974, he finally started to show signs of aging. Not too bad. He went from being on display to being sent to Paris to get a glow up, you know, to preserve the king's body even longer. Instead of being listed as luggage on the way to Paris, the pharaoh was given an official Egyptian passport for the commute. The government gave a mummy a passport. This is like the first five minutes of a horror film. Under occupation, it even said king. And there was even a small disclaimer noting that he was in fact still dead. You can never be too sure, you know? Number nine, baboon tattoos. Ancient Egyptians worshiped animals. This is common knowledge now at this point. We've heard about their love towards cats, which I'll explain later on, but what about baboons? Yeah, they were pretty important pieces to this ancient puzzle as well. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. Now, one of the most strange things that pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Imagine stealing a pair for your family and then four baboons start doing parkour, chasing you down. That's so alarming. I would just throw it and be like, please stop. You're so scary and strong. They train baboons to pick fruit. They train them to make beer and they also train them to entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to tattoo one on my arm. So you know what? I get it. Get a Harambe tattoo. I'm like, you know, I, it's, I, I see it. I see the similarities. Number eight, worship dung beetles. So worshiping a baboon that dances and makes holiday ales, yeah, I can see how one would worship such a creature. That makes sense. But pharaohs also worship dung beetles and their reasoning may surprise you. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way naturally. Animals are born with natural instincts. Sea turtles race to the sea. These guys follow the cosmos. It's pretty wild. It's one thing to follow the sun naturally because it gives off warmth. Sunflowers will literally turn their head to find the sun, which is super creepy, but it's beautiful. These insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their poop towards it. They'd be like, hello Milky Way, and they just... Hieroglyphs of these beetles are seen all over. Like near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, for example, there's a massive scarab monument. And today, if you walk around it nine times, you get good luck. And don't worry, you don't have to roll any droppings at the same time. Don't get dizzy, that's all, it's the only rule. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which ancient Egyptians believed was the sun. I grew up thinking the sun was a baby, but that's because I watched Teletubbies, so, you know, depends. Number seven, surprise each other. Cleopatra and Julius Caesar were a pretty beneficial couple, to say the least. Cleopatra would use Caesar's armies, which in turn would allow her to rule Egypt, while Caesar was eyeing down Cleopatra's extreme wealth. They were the perfect pair. She was able to financially support Caesar enough for him to return to power back in Rome, but how did such a perfect pair meet in the first place? Did Cleopatra swipe right? Hmm, no. Well, a then 52-year-old Julius Caesar visited the much younger Cleopatra, so she then sent a surprise gift to his chambers. She got her crew to roll her up in a carpet or bed sheet, that's not really confirmed, something along those lines, and then delivered her to his door, completely nude. He unraveled a naked Cleopatra, and he's like, okay, hello. That's pretty impressive. Cleopatra was down for fun surprises. While we don't recommend this as an approach ever, it's one worth mentioning on our list. Number six, gender reveal parties. We've all seen those videos. A guy goes to hit a baseball, he misses it, the baseball breaks and there's pink dust all around his feet and he starts crying, it's wonderful. Gender reveal parties were quite popular, you know, until they started lighting wildfires. But back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. Instead of peeing on a pregnancy test, you would have to use wheat and barley seeds instead. Depending on how those barley crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. They were right 85% of the time, which is quite impressive back in the day. We went from watering crops to burning them. Hashtag, it's a boy. 
Number five, Space Knife. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archaeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with the king. Now, like I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon to be buried with your treasure or belongings. It's why ancient Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so grave robbers can't just sneak in after you pass away and then take all of your goodies. So two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other with gold. Now, with iron being more rare than gold during the Bronze Age, this was quite a big deal. With recent advancements in technology, we're able to use a technique called portable X-ray fluorescent spectrometry, and according to the journal Meteorites and Planetary Science, the blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that its material is that of extraterrestrial origin. A blade fell from the sky, and now a king has it. That's pretty insane. Also, aliens? Just saying. Number four, KV-55. Also located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KV-55, was found by Edward Arton back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason that we call this tomb by a number rather than a name is because we really don't know for sure who's inside. Even the walls of the tombs inside, they aren't covered with beautiful hieroglyphs to tip us off on their history or their ruling, it's just bare. The only hint as to who is buried remains on the walls. It's one hieroglyph that remains, and it was discovered also in 1907, and it translates simply to, the evil one shall not live again. That's very scary. That's Definitely scarier than Greg was here. I don't know. Even massive stones were built and set up in order to prevent anything from getting out. Whereas usually with ancient tombs, it's the opposite. So that's pretty scary. The description for those inside the tomb has also been destroyed. So we have really no idea who's in KB 55 or what. <laughs> Number three, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens and they look athletic. They look to be in great shape, when in reality, these pharaohs were probably quite obese. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day and you have baboons dancing around, plus a little dab of honey every, I don't know, eight minutes, yeah, you're gonna gain some weight. Many of these ancient pharaohs had diabetes. And Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong, but historians all agree that she was out of shape and extremely unhealthy. Honestly, I would do the exact same if I was there back then. She was ahead of her time. If somebody made a statue for me, I'd be like, yeah, give it an eight pack, make him extremely jacked and seven two. Can we do that? Sure, no one's gonna ask questions. I'm Dwayne The Rock Johnston, just write it down, please. Number two, worship cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still love them. I still pet them. I ruined my entire night just to get my face right there next to their cute little furry face. But ancient Egyptians, like I said earlier, really loved cats. They respected them, they worshiped them. Even though at the time dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. So if there's ever a cat versus dog argument going on on your end of the screen, cats win. I'm allergic and I'm still saying cats win. That's, that's huge. If you had a cat, it means you had good luck. When cats passed away, they too were mummified back in the day. You would think that alone was plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs went a step further. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and then mourn until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. Next time your friend tells you that their cat passed away, tell them that if they really love them, they'll shave their eyebrows off and then see what they say. Also, you don't have to make your friends shave their eyebrows. Let's leave this one in the past. That's fun. Just be sad with eyebrows. Be like, hmm. Number one, fight a hippo. Egypt's first pharaoh, Menes, although we know next to nothing about his history, there is something there that has historians scratching their heads to this day. At his early time, the pharaoh was setting out to unite all of Egypt under his rule. The time that he ruled as well is considered a rather peaceful time when comparing it to years later. We know that he was well respected, and we also know that after his 63 years of peaceful ruling, he was stomped to death by a hippo. That's horrible, it's a horrible way to go out. He was an elderly ruler at that time. He was surrounded by guards and somehow a hippo got all the way to his chambers. A hippo, and then ended the pharaoh's life. Some suggest that the reason there's nothing written about this pharaoh's tragic, horrible demise is because it's possible that the hippo was his pet. This is why you don't try and tame a beast as a pet. Perhaps this was an early similar situation as the Siegfried and Roy tiger attack. Just stick to smaller magical cats. They're much safer, they won't 
stop you to death. Oh my god, it's horrible. Number 10, overshadowed and the beard. Hatshepsut for a long while was content to play the supporting role among Egypt's royals. But when she decided she wasn't anymore, things took a turn. She was the daughter of Thutmose I and wife slash sister to her half-brother Thutmose II. I know, don't worry, I'll address it later in the video, stay tuned. When he died in 1479 BC and left their son as heir, she took on the role as regent to Thutmose III. But she basically just acted as the rightful ruler. As the young king came of age finally, she declared herself pharaoh. The strangest part was that she chose to portray herself in pictures as a man with a male body and a false beard. She said that the god Amun was her father and insisted that he commanded her to take charge of Egypt. Who's gonna argue with a god, right? But no one could quite explain the issue with the beard. Nevertheless, during her reign, it was a time of peace and prosperity for Egypt. Number 9, Sesostris. Sesostris was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, who was celebrated for the extent of his conquests. He stretched the kingdom further than anyone before him, but he was not without his quirks. According to accounts by Herodotus, Sesostris left pillars on every battlefield. Along with the usual bragging and boasting of how he won, he would carve into them images of genitalia, like people do on the bathroom stalls, you know? If he thought that his enemy fought valiantly, he carved a If he thought they didn't put much of a fight, he would carve a Great. Yeah, that just goes to show what he thought about things, huh? The latter was a sign of disrespect for his subdued enemies, while the other was a sign of honor, like, hey man, you stuck it to me. Apparently, some even stood the test of time, lasting over 1,500 years, and seen firsthand by Herodotus himself. For those of you who don't know, for reference, Herodotus is considered as the father of historians, one of the very first to take up the task. Number eight, ceremonial seating. The whole idea behind the pharaohs was that they were direct descendants from the gods themselves. Therefore, they too had deific powers and had the capability of restoring life to the land. The Nile River had significant importance to the people of Egypt. It provided fertile soil and water irrigation. It was pretty awesome. In order to ensure its abundance would continue, pharaohs would organize a festival where they would ceremoniously fill it with their seed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Some historians believe that this was in honor of the creation story of how life came to be and therefore it was kind of like a fertility festival. Crowds would gather at the Nile and await the arrival of their pharaoh. They would then disrobe and give their pleasure into the river to ensure its bounty. Some historians say it was just the pharaoh who did this while others say that the men joined in after. Evidence still remains pretty slim as to whether this really did happen so take this one with a grain of salt but that's not to say that there isn't any evidence at all that it did happen, so there. Number seven, deliver me naked. Cleopatra is known as one of the most beautiful women in history, but this could be due to how she used her feminine wiles to get what she wanted. Her beauty and cunning became renowned as a result. While other queens, like the one I mentioned before, concealed their beauty, Cleopatra was all about showing it off, cause girl, if you got it, flaunt it. In order to help secure the political ally and power connected to Caesar, Cleopatra knew how to make an entrance and knew how to win over a guy. It's, it's pretty easy. He was around 52 when they met and the Egyptian queen was just like 20 and in her prime, so. She looked great. She smuggled herself into Alexandria, where Caesar was staying, had her servant tie her up in a bed sack, naked, and carried indoors to Caesar, and she was like, have at her, buddy. In other words, she wrapped her naked body in a carpet, made Caesar's jaw drop to the floor, and secured one of the most beneficial unions on the spot. Honestly, not really messed up. Kind of badass, honestly. Just do your thing, work it, girl. I dream of having that confidence with my clothes on. You know what I mean? Go girl, you got this, you get that empire. Number six, Cats and the Battle. Ancient Egypt would have welcomed the film the adaptation of Cats, unlike the rest of the world, with open arms and probably would have built a shrine to it. Giant human cats eating human cockroaches would be revered. Bottom line, cats in ancient Egypt were worshipped and treated like family. It was considered a crime punishable by death to harm one due to the belief in the goddess Bastet. One pharaoh even risked losing a battle because of cats themselves. The Battle of Pelusium of 525 BC 
Gizi between Pharaoh Samek III and the Persian king Cambyses II resulted in the first Persian conquest of Egypt all because of cats. Cambyses took advantage of the cat loving side of Egypt and used hostages of cats and animals as leverage. So they were just kind of like, well we can't, we can't fight if the cats are let loose. What are we going to do? We can't kill the cats. And that's that's uh, how they lost that battle. Number five, honey coated. Who here hates bugs bothering them in the summer? Unless they're a bumblebee, because we love bumblebees here, right guys? But me too. No one likes the buzzing of blood suckers nipping at your skin while you're chilling out on the beach or barbecue. Well, guess what? Egyptian pharaohs hated it too, except they didn't have bug spray. So what did they do? Well, you know the phrase, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? Well, they took that literally. Conveniently, they had servants around them at all times, so to help with the bug problem, they covered them with honey so as to distract the bees and the bugs. So as the pharaohs lounged on the sand, or wherever they were, their dutiful servants took on the job of taking on the bug bites. King Pepe, for instance, had a dedicated slave in his entourage who endured it every day. Poor guy. It was so effective that he had one designated in each room. Poor guys. Number four, assassins. This wasn't necessarily something that he did, but something that happened to him that was pretty messed up. As you can guess from the title, it involved assassins. Ramses III had a lot on his plate during his reign. There were this group of seafarers trying to destroy everyone. The tomb builders did their first labor strike over wage delays. I get you. The economy was deteriorating. Weather was devastating food production. Things were corrupt as hell. And on top of all this, his secondary wife, T.A., hated his guts. She, along with a dozen members of his harem, the head of the treasury, a military captain, a butler, the butler did it, and the chief royal chief. Chamberlain hatched an assassination plot. In 2012, researchers used a high powered CT scanner on Ramsey's mummy and saw a massive throat gash covered by an amulet said to have healing powers. The researchers summarized that an assassin cut through Ramsey's esophagus and trachea, killing him practically instantly because he probably would have just let out that fast. Some other research suggests that this happened before the other assassination plot unraveled, but either way, not a good way to go. Number three, till death do us part. Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning? Well, if you were a servant to a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, you were hoping that your dude lived a long time because once they bite the dust, so did you. Now keep in mind, ancient Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife. So when you died, you didn't just disappear, you literally just traveled to another world. That's the whole idea behind religion anyway. The discovery team organized by NYU, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania discovered macabre evidence of this tradition. While excavating the mortuary ritual site of Pharaoh Aha, they found six graves not far from his tomb. They were skeletons of court officials, servants, artisans who appear to have been sacrificed to serve the Pharaoh in the afterlife. Aha's successor, Dajir, had more than 200, which are also presumed to be sacrificial burials as well. Number two, Marrying your siblings. Again, remember the thing I mentioned before and now I'm actually getting to it? Promised, I promised, and here we are. Not so long ago, it was normal to court your very own cousin, but today that would be considered very large taboo. I'm not gonna lie, it gives me the skippies, okay? I don't like imagining ma even marrying any of my cousins. That's weird to me. But the ancient Egyptians took things even farther, or should I say brought it closer, by marrying their very own siblings. Hey. That's one way to guarantee that the line will stay in the family. But knowing what we know about the genetic pool being too close and the complications that can arise, there's things that can go wrong. But nevertheless, it happened. DNA testing from King Tut's corpse revealed that he was a product of a union between two siblings. Pharaohs believed that they were descended from the gods. Therefore, keeping it in the family was crucial in maintaining that bloodline. King Tut even married his own half-sister, same dad, when he was just 10 years old. However, generations of inbreeding resulted in a bone disease that got more severe each time. Cleopatra also married her own brother as well. That was a that was a whole thing, and then she met Caesar and that whole thing we talked about. Yeah, that thing. Let's move on. Number one, Akhenaten. One of the most polarizing figures in Egyptian history, Akhenaten tried to get rid of religion and as a result, they got rid of him. Akhenaten earned the title of heretic king and a recent discovery has revealed that his deeds might have been a lot darker. Akhenaten came to power in the 1350s and reigned for around 17 years. He is known for creating a new religion surrounding Aten, who was generally represented as a sun disc. Sometime around his fourth year, he started sending out agents to erase names and images 
images of certain gods from existing texts and monuments. Around the fifth year, he claimed to discover the location of the new royal city and moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, today known as Tel el Amarna. There, his people suffered greatly under slave labor, with bodies being uncovered younger than 20, many with bones broken, spines broken, along with evidence of severe malnutrition. When the pharaoh finally passed, his tomb remained unfinished and his name was stricken from the history books. At least now, we can see why. Starting off our list at number 10, the first peace treaty. Unusual at the time? Absolutely. The first peace treaty in history was back in 1271 BC. At this point in history, Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting centuries and come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was finally underway. Tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. What's left to do now at this point? Ramses II and King Hattusili III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if a third party decided to get involved. A copy of the treaty can be found right now in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official. Our man Guinness confirms it. Boom, that's how you know. Moving on. Number nine, game night. I love board games, and honestly, that includes Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then, you know? Pass and go, I'm like, okay, I'll pay the tax. I'm respecting this game so far. But ancient Egyptians, turns out they also loved board games. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen, Senate, and 20 Squares, those are some popular games. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC, and the goal here was to reach the center of the spiral. The board was a coiled snake almost. Senate was the most popular game. Kings and queens alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Of course, the rules are still unknown, heavily debated, just like Monopoly today. I'm like, is it 200 or 100? Are we sure? But now we have some ideas how Egyptians played Senate. There were three rows of 10 squares. The last five were always decorated. Now it's assumed this game was themed on the afterlife. Plus King Tut was buried with one of these boards. So that's definitely something to do with it. And there's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate. So, you know, it was addictive. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a Pharaoh in chess. My palms are already so sweaty. Number eight, glamor. Makeup in ancient Egyptian culture was key. Not only did they wear makeup and smell good because they wanted to resemble the very gods they believed in, but makeup had a practical use as well in the daily life of a pharaoh. They believed makeup gave you protection from the gods Ra and Horus. They would put together these beauty kits by grinding down malachite and galena, and then they would create the substance called coal. There wasn't a lot of blending back then. Makeup was often applied directly to the skin using wood or bone. And it wasn't just the ladies as well. Men wore makeup and perfume. Of course, you gotta look good and smell good. Be like, have you seen them? What? I, I wanna wear some of this. They smell like beautifulness. They smell like the afterlife. They smell amazing. Egyptians believed makeup had healing abilities, and honestly, they weren't wrong. Makeup back then had enough lead in them, so eye infections would stay away, ideally. Number seven, Cleopatra's methods. Male rulers took the name Ptolemy and queens were Cleopatra. Her lineage runs deep in the heart of Egypt, but Cleopatra, fun fact, she was not actually Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BCE, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this new wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted centuries. As Cleopatra got older, she was determined to learn Egyptian. And due to political structure, she started to style herself as the goddess Isis. And then in comes Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar had a history of his own, obviously, and his, rather than family and power, was filled more with, you know, lust more than anything. He was known to sleep around and then use their power after doing the dirty. When these two crossed paths, history was never the same. In October of 50 BCE, Cleopatra had fled to Syria. Once there, she established an army and returned two years later to face her brother. Cleopatra knew that during this time, she needed all the support she could get, specifically now from the Romans. At the same time, Caesar was looking to collect debts from Cleopatra's father, so they both relied on each other in some way. It was a match made in heaven. Your most compatible has been updated. Right swipe. I would right swipe on Alexander the Great, for sure. I'd be like, who's this handsome man? Mm. Nicknamed Bald Adulterer. Okay, you know, he's trouble. Number six, King Tut. 
One of the greatest mysteries is of course the history of the young King Tut. The young boy became pharaoh at just age 9 in 1332 BC, but during his time of ruling the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh died at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was seen again, Howard Carter discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful here in history. Sure, it's exciting finding mummies and discovering your history and all that jazz, but when King Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin. But in doing so, they damaged him. So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age. We have some ideas though, it's not entirely hopeless. It's believed right now that King Tut had a broken leg. After some 3D scans were done, it appears the king wasn't in the best shape prior. He may have fallen off of a chariot. So if Tut passed away at an early age, out of nowhere, this could mean another mystery is afoot. Number five, Queen Nefertiti's resting place. So yes, on one hand, 3D scanning technology is vital when it comes to these ancient sites. We're able to figure out King Tut's medical issues from thousands of years ago. It's impressive, it's great. But thanks to this new technology, we're also finding hidden chambers in these tombs as well. Another theory surrounding the queen, the lost queen, Nefertiti, is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this at all. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. But, but King Tut passed away at age 19, so many believe that his own burial chamber at that point wasn't even built yet. So instead, they had to use hers, they had to improvise. A radar survey conducted around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us a possible hidden chamber, right behind the north wall of the burial chamber. We still haven't found her final resting place, but perhaps this recent 2021 discovery of an ancient city will hold us off until then. Look at this, we missed this on the news. Where was all this? Crazy. Number four, a fake beard. Not really unusual considering the times, but this is definitely worth a mention. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty and there were only just a few that were women in total. But during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. This was her goal, this was her vision. The pharaoh fake beard, massive muscles, historians believe this was done as an act of politics. It was done on purpose to make a point. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson then took the throne, Thutmose III. And then he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Number three, no more religion. This was a huge deal in ancient Egypt, rightfully so. The pharaoh Akhenaten thought it would be a great idea to just end multiple religious beliefs. Yep, just uh, stop. Okay, now we just do the one. Traditional Egyptian culture would believe in multiple gods, but this pharaoh couldn't keep up, so he convinced everybody to believe in just one god, Aten. Well, only days after his passing, the people of Egypt said, screw that, we're gonna go back to multiple beliefs. That was working a lot better for us, thank you, sir. And then also we're destroying every piece of evidence that involves you for trying that nonsense. Yeah, temples, cooking pots, anything with his image, gone and ideally forgotten. It wasn't until the 19th century when we realized this pharaoh once ruled. Number two, hippo problems. Do you have any idea how fast hippos are in real life? I had no clue my entire life. They're really fast, they fly at you, they're like dinosaurs. Hippos can run as fast as 50 kilometers an hour. Yeah, I'll just lead with that. Pharaoh Menes was Egypt's first pharaoh ever, so it felt fitting to include some pet problems in our list. We don't know much about the lost pharaoh because, well, for starters, he was alive a very long time ago, 3000 BC, that's where we're talking. But what we do know for certain is that King Menes ruled over Egypt during a peaceful time, and he was stomped to death by a hippo. It's literally how his history.com says it, in that order. This king spent over 60 years on the throne and a hippo got him. I don't think there's a harder way to go out, honestly, in my opinion. It's a mystery still, thousands of years later, but look at zoos today. I don't know, maybe a hippo didn't like living like a king. Maybe he wanted to live like Shrek and just splash around and be dirty. He's an animal, he's literally a hippo, you know? And finally coming in at number one, a renewed passport. I'll be honest, right now, I currently have no idea where my passport is. Chris, do you know where yours is? Yeah. Wow, we have an adult here. Wow, an adult, that's lovely. I always panic and search for it 13 hours before a flight. I am the worst to travel with. Passports are important, obviously, and they're a pain in the ass to replace. 
But did you know you can still get one even if you've been dead for, I don't know, thousands of years? Here's a fun fact. Pharaoh Ramses II, one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers, got a passport back in 1974. Yeah, you heard me. After being exhumed and put on display for so long, it was decided it's time to send the lost king off to Paris to get, you know, a little touched up being dead that long and all. Now obviously you're not gonna list this pharaoh as luggage, that's so rude. So the Egyptian government gave Ramses II his own official Egyptian passport for his commute. On the passport he had his age, his occupation, king obviously, and in case it wasn't clear, it was stated that the king too was deceased. Anyone who's seen the mummy can obviously, you know, relax at that point. Kicking off the list at number 10, Ramses II. Ramses II, part two, you see what I'm doing here. He's considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Ramses II is still considered the ruler of rulers. It's not a bad title, not bad at all. In year 30 of his reign, Ramses II was ritually transformed into an Egyptian god. Not bad, I'm turning 30 in a few years. I hope someone turns me into a god or gets me like a bike, <laughs> one of the two, I'll take both. So it was only fair if the spoiled pharaoh erected a bunch of statues of himself. Yeah, big selfies. Ramses put up more selfies than any other pharaoh in history. Most famous of them, the temples of Abu Simbel. There lies a monument dedicated to the late queen Nefertiti and the Ramseum. We kicked off a part one with Ramses signing the first ever peace treaty, so, so for part two we had to show some of the glamour side of him, you know? Number nine, over 100 children. Who is this guy, Nick Cannon? Ramses II is the father to over 100 children. Uh, with that, of course, came the you know 200 wives, otherwise, ow and how, if it was just one person. Ow and how, you know? <laughs> it's guesstimated that Ramses had 96 sons and 60 daughters. Of all those children, Ramses outlived a lot of them. It's almost like living as a king helped, perhaps, maybe, I don't know, maybe you ate better. Maybe, just a hint, just an idea. Eventually, Ramses was succeeded by his 13th son with his favorite queen, Queen Nefertari, giving her the fanciest tomb in the Valley of the Queens. Nefertari's tomb contains paintings that some consider are the greatest works of ancient Egyptian art. Not bad, I had like baseball wallpaper on mine growing up. Tomb QV66, he spoiled his lady, look at this. We gotta love him. Her tomb is 520 square meters covered in beautiful art, but in 1904 when Nefertari's tomb was rediscovered, all that was found was her mummified knees. Yeah, all that was left was her kneecaps. What, like, who does this? Raiders had stolen all the treasure prior, sometime in the many moons she had been lying there, and they even took her body and left her knees. Like, what? Monsters. They're like, yeah, grab the treasure, leave the patellas. Let's do it. Number eight, ready to strike. Pharaohs may have looked beautiful living and after death, but they meant business, okay? They were protective of their land, their family, their many, many lovers and children. The symbol often worn by pharaohs were symbols of power, a Nemes crown. This crown was a striped headcloth and the back of their head was covered with an aureus symbol, AKA an upside down cobra. The cobra symbol represents that the pharaoh is always ready and willing to attack their enemies, attack them with venom. It's a pretty cool symbol. Mine just says DC Etnies Shoes. I'm like, I don't, this says fight me, if anything. DC Skate Shop in my back. I'm like, yeah, you can just attack me, that's cool. Number seven, King Teddy. The Pyramid of Teddy was built for the first ruler of the sixth dynasty. While it's not as flashy or massive as other pyramids, inside it contains the oldest writing ever, in the religious world, that is. Inside it contains the pyramid texts, these legendary texts. They go all the way back to 2400 BC. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this king, King Teddy, could ascend to the heavens after his death. This isn't bizarre behavior by any means, but King Teddy, he was specific. He wanted to be a star, like a literal star. There are spells and incantations that are in this tomb meant to free the king's soul as he arrives in the cosmos. More specifically for Teddy to become a star in the sky and join Osiris and Orion in the Hashtag God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to these heavens. It's one thing to be buried with your gold, then you can live another life, but to become a star? I need to expand my dreams, my gosh. King Teddy was onto something here. When I go in my will, I'm gonna be like, can I become a star, is that possible? Can I just throw me up into the heavens? Can I do that? Or bury me, that's cool. Bury me in Ajax, that works. <laughs> Number six, Yozer. For this one, we're looking into some bowl worshiping. So if you're a fan of bowls, here, this one's perfect for you, weirdly enough. Just north of the Steppe Pyramid of Pharaoh Dozier, archeologist August Mariette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium, it's a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, and it's a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. This was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls, these bulls that were said to be sacred, of course, and after their death, they would become immortal. Immortal bulls, that sounds badass. 
and also terrifying. That's very scary. Don't wear red around these guys. Today at Saqqara, there's a massive vault. It's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock. It's huge, and along the sides, there's 24 chambers, each with a sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Just impossible craftsmanship all around, especially at these times. Like, oh my god, my wrists are tired just typing about this, let alone doing this. Inside these boxes were animal remains, bones and all that jazz, but back in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. You had to mummify them, right? Hence part one and where we are now. How are these tombs built so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and also, where do these bones come from? I have so many questions. Maybe on part three we'll answer them. Number five, we love cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still go for it. I still pet them. I risk everything just to... Yes, I don't care. I ruined my entire weekend just to get my face all up in their whiskers. Nobody did it like ancient Egyptians. You've probably heard this at one point or another. They worshipped cats. They were like, you know, the legendary <laughs> cats. That was, that was their thing. I'm more of a golden retriever guy, but I get it. They're cute. They respected them. They worshipped them. Even though at the time, dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. It's because they just stare at shit randomly. Mid-conversation, a cat will just be like... No, they're not magical, they're terrifying. They're on something. If you had a cat, you had good luck, apparently. A friend of mine has two fat cats. He has some pretty good luck, I think. If they're fat, they're good, hmm. When a cat passed away back in ancient Egyptian times, they too were mummified. You would think that alone was just plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs, they would obviously go a step further. Hence this fun list. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and would mourn them until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. That's, I, I got over my childhood animal in like six business days. It's not a bad thing, it's just that's a long time, you know? Next time your friend tells you their cat passed away, tell them if they really love them, they would shave their eyebrows. Test them. Number four, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, well, all the pharaohs were considered kings, but it was equal at the time. And they all look athletic. They all look like these warriors, right? They look to be in great shape. When in reality, a lot of these pharaohs were probably pretty overweight or unhealthy. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day, plus a little dab of honey every eight minutes, you're gonna gain some weight. Yeah, that's how it goes. Many of these ancient pharaohs did have diabetes, and Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong and all that jazz, but almost all historians agree that she was out of shape and quite unhealthy. Honestly, fair. I would do the exact same thing. She was ahead of her time. If somebody was like, hey, I'm gonna make a statue for you. What should I make it look like? I'm like, no, yeah, give him an eight pack. Make him jacked. I don't know. Make him look like Michael Jordan. I don't know. Number three, gender reveal parties. Okay, we've seen all these videos online. A guy goes to swing and hit a baseball. He misses, it hits the ground. There's a big pink cloud of smoke. Everyone's like, oh my God. Gender reveal parties, right? They're pretty popular. Turns out they're popular back in ancient Egyptian days. But nobody did it like them. Also, nobody started any wildfires back then when any uh, ancient Egyptians did it, so that's nice. We should go take a note from them. Back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. You would have to use wheat and barley seeds. You'd have to pee on them. And then, however it grew, that would determine the sex. I would feel bad. First of all, I'd be like, hi, we're curious. Don't mind us. I'm just gonna pee on your crops, sir. Let us know how it grows. We're really aiming towards a boy this time. We have 96 girls, so we're gonna try a couple of boys. Yeah, depending on how the crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. And it worked a lot of the time. It's pretty wild. We went from watering crops to burning them down just to find out a gender. Hashtag it's a boy. Number two, more tattoos. More tattoos for number two. We love it. You guys saw what I did. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. We talked about that, the whole cat stuff and the whole hippo situation in part one, that was violent. But what about baboons? Did they get any love? Baboons, I say it weird, baboons, baboons. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. One of the most strange things pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Yep, stop resisting, you're going to jail. Me and seven baboons, let's carry them into the car, bam. Imagine stealing food for your family just to like try and get by and four baboons pop out, start doing parkour and then arrest you in front of everyone. That'd be so embarrassing and also alarming. They trained baboons to pick fruit, make beer and even entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party apparently. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to get a tattoo of one of my arms, honestly. Going all crazy, throwing their own at people, I'd be like, yeah, right here or here, I don't care. And finally, number one, the afterlife. 
One of the most fascinating parts about these ancient Egyptian pharaohs is that they would pass away literally covered in gold, head to toe. It's nice to know that this long ago, some of these kings and queens still rest untouched by grave robbers or explorers. The afterlife for these pharaohs was important. And as soon as they take on the throne, work is immediately underway on their tomb. That's a little grim when you think about it. It's like, hey, congratulations. We're gonna start making where you're gonna be buried. It's like, thanks, I think. These monuments took time, but they were built to last. And clearly, they have. Pharaoh's eyes were painted black with coal. They did this so that they would look like the god Horus after they passed on. Number 10, Tutankhamun. This guy is arguably the most famous Egyptian pharaoh. So what is he doing at the top of the list? Well, King Tut wasn't famous for anything he really did in his lifetime. I mean, he was a young pharaoh, but someone on this list was technically pharaoh since he was two. No, he wasn't famous for anything he really did. Instead, Tutankhamun's tomb, discovered in 1922, was one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever. It was almost entirely intact, and his sarcophagus was incredible. Tutankhamun only lived to the age of 20, and how he lost the spark of life is actually still a mystery. He may not have done much other than a lot of religious reforms, but he managed to find another way of living forever. Number 9. Djoser So, with King Tut, he didn't really do much in his short lifetime. With Djoser, we actually don't really know a lot of what he did. Also like Tutankhamun, it was what he did for and after his departure from life that made him famous. Djoser was responsible for the construction of the limestone steppe pyramid at Saqqara, the first of its kind. It was a huge architectural achievement. A building that stays structurally sound no matter how big it gets? Well, knock me down and call me Susan. The pyramid was actually completed after he lost the will to live by his official Imhotep. Number 8, Amenhotep III. Okay, on to the members of the list who we know did something significant for Egypt during their time on the earth. Amenhotep III ruled an artistically and financially successful Egypt. He had pretty stellar reviews on Google for his trade relations which boosted up the economy of Egypt, but it was his artistic side that got him a bit more of a lasting recognition. He is the pharaoh with the most statues of himself. He created tons of monuments and a lot of stone scarabs that still hold up with tons of stories of historical events. I want some statues myself. Is, is that weird? Probably. Number 7. Hatshepsut Now look, women in Egypt had high status and were respected more than in other parts of the world at the time. But a female pharaoh, while not unheard of, was unfortunately still pretty rare. Hatshepsut here was known as the most successful of those female pharaohs. Her father, King Thutmose I, wanted her to inherit the throne, and to that end, she was brought up learning how to lead. She reigned for 21 years after the death of her husband, and everything she did, from tons of construction projects to creating trade routes, went off without a single hitch. The people of Egypt lived in peace for her entire rule. Number 6. Thutmose III Thutmose III was, surprisingly, the son of Thutmose II, who was the husband of Hatshepsut. You know, number seven, the most successful female pharaoh. So that's the kind of cloth we're working with here. Thutmose was only two when his father bit the dust. So while he was technically the next pharaoh, his stepmother took over with him as co-ruler. This guy's contributions to the Egyptians were tremendous, though. He was literally called the Napoleon of Egypt, which, Shouldn't Napoleon be the Thutmose the Third of France? Either way, Thutmose the Third. He helped expand Egypt like none before. He was a dope warrior and he helped in the construction of a lot of stuff. Most importantly, the Temple of Karnak. That's how you make mama proud. Number five, Xerxes the First. You've most likely heard of this guy. If not from his historically inaccurate portrayal in 300, then at least from one or two history classes. But Adam, wasn't he the emperor of Persia? Yeah, well, guess what, my little bees? Egypt was part of the Persian Empire, which makes him pharaoh as well. This guy gets a pretty bad rap in history. But who wrote that history? The Greeks who despised him for his attempted invasion of Greece. Oh, I'm not saying he was great or anything. In fact, he had a bit of a disregard for the traditions of the Egyptians and their way of life. But you cannot tell me that he was not significant in history. 
Xerxes the Great makes this list for his infamy more than anything else. Number four, Akhenaten. So this is gonna be the second not so beloved pharaoh on this list. But disdain for Akhenaten didn't come from war or the fact that his massive army was defeated by a group of a couple hundred Greeks. No, Akhenaten here was infamous for his devout following of a singular god, Aten, the god of the sun. He actually moved the capital of Egypt to a new location that he titled Akhetaten, or Horizon of Aten. And he kind of made everyone else worship the single god Aten as well. He was famous for a different reason though. Akhenaten was married to Nefertiti. She played a huge part in his religious plans and she is well known in history for the limestone bust that was made of her and has been copied so many freaking times. Number three, Khufu. When you think of Egypt, there is likely one thing that pops straight into your mind. If you say anything other than the Great Pyramids of Giza, you do not pass go, you do not collect $200, and you lose. Khufu is the pharaoh you have to thank for this wonder of the ancient world. We still sorta of don't know exactly how it was constructed, but this Goliath limestone and mud brick structure was the tallest building in the world for like 4,000 years. It was built as the housing for his tomb and as his stairway to heaven. No, not the Led Zeppelin song. It has three chambers inside of it, plus a gallery that we've discovered so far. As for what else Khufu contributed to ancient Egyptian life, we don't have much in the way of texts about that yet. But if this is the main thing, then I mean, I'd take it. Number two, Cleopatra. How could she not be on this list? She was the very last pharaoh Egypt ever had, and she was arguably one of the most famous ones. Not only becoming a figure in history, but a character in literature, theater, and media. Cleopatra VII was pharaoh in Egypt from 51 to 30 BC, and it was one hell of a reign. She introduced tons of reforms to improve the Egyptian economy. She was an awesome diplomat and a scholar. She didn't have things too easy though. Having to fight her own brother for the throne and having to do some diplomacy with various famous Romans. Things kind of fizzle out near the end, but she certainly ended the line of Egyptian pharaohs with a beloved bang, as was her style. Number one, Ramses II. All right, this one was definitely the one I thought of first. Ramses II is arguably the most famous of all the pharaohs. He reigned for 67 years. He had 96 children. He had a crazy successful military campaign conquering the Hittites, Syrians, and Nubians. No other pharaoh that we know of has been able to build like he has. He lived to the age of 90, which is insane for back then. And he professed himself a god, which I'm sure some people actually believed. Even today, when we moved his remains to France for restoration, he had to be given a passport that literally said, King, deceased, under the occupation. Truly an incredibly influential pharaoh. Mr. Unpopular, Xerxes I is number 10. Xerxes is one of two pharaohs on the list who wasn't actually Egyptian, and it ultimately puts Homi in some hot water. He ruled during the 27th dynasty whilst Egypt was a part of the Persian Empire, having the throne from 486 to 465 BC. These Persian kings were acknowledged as a pharaoh despite not being Egyptian, so Xerxes the Great, as he was known, earns a place on our list by virtue of fame. He wasn't so great to the Egyptians though. He had a disregard for their traditions and religious beliefs and allocated funds away from their temple. He also banged his niece and gave her the robe that his wife had made for him, so his wife had her sister-in-law mutilated as revenge. It was this whole big scandal. But it caused Xerxes' brother to try and usurp him, something that Xerxes was already dealing with constantly as back at home in Babylonia, as well as in Egypt, people were trying to steal the throne away from him, causing him to ping pong back and forth between the two places. When he wasn't doing that, Xerxes was failing disastrously at trying to invade Greece. Eventually the embarrassment of his consistent failure to do so and the endless coup attempts on him was a bit too much and Xerxes abandoned the Egyptian throne. His failed attempts to invade Greece ensured that his portrayal by Greek historians and by extension the film 300 hasn't been very kind. Number 9 is a famous hussy, Ramses II. This man could not keep it in his pants. Sure, 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 he was the greatest leader of the 19th dynasty and an amazing tactical mind and 
and made Egypt prosperous, blah blah. He's the son of Seti the first, and Ramesses went on to declare himself a god and the ruler of Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is an insane number for an era where the life expectancy was 30. But homeboy was not a modest pharaoh by any means. He was a lying two-faced politician who based his entire campaign on a laundry list of fabrications. The extensive architectural legacy of his reign are thought to have left the throne close to bankruptcy at the time of his death. Before getting to that ripe old age, as mentioned, Ramesses spent any free time he had Banging. Enough to sire between 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his sons. Ramses was one of the first rulers to take on the title of the Great before it was cool. All in all, he was pompous and spoiled. He left behind more statues of himself than any other person in the history of the world. He was obsessed with outshining all those who came before him, and he would tower over all those that would follow. Speaking of testament to ego, number eight is Khufu, the son of Seneferu, which I'm probably butchering, who is the first pharaoh to build pyramids. Khufu was on a one-upping mission since day one. He commissioned the Pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world, which by the way we learned not too long ago is lopsided. The pyramid was originally covered in white limestone adorned with gold and since stripped away by greedy tourists over the last 4,000 plus years. He used his platform to also establish mining and trade from what's now modern day Lebanon. Unfortunately, while he brought greatness to Egypt in ways of infrastructure and economy, socially he inspired a lot of mixed reviews due to his use of forced labor and a dismissive nature. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus was a particular critic, depicting Khufu as a vicious tyrant who used slaves to build his great pyramid. Now, many Egyptologists believe that these claims are merely defamatory, guided by the Greek viewpoint that such structures could only be built through greed and misery. If those rumors are true, then Khufu had high expectations and forced labor and no one liked him. If they're not, then he wasn't a bad guy at all. Number seven is Cambyses, the animal hater. This this is the other Persian pharaoh on our countdown, and he too enjoyed picking on the Egyptians he ruled, but in a very indirect way. See, Cambyses enjoyed watching animals suffer. It's said in his spare time he put on fights between lion cubs and puppies and made his wife watch as they t tore each other apart. In fact, nearly every story coming out of Egypt at the time of his rule told about Cambyses involved him ruining the life of one animal or another. Early on, he went to see Apis, the bull that Egyptians treated as a god. Right in front of the priests dedicated to Apis, he pulled out a dagger and just start stabbing the bull until it died, laughing at them and saying, this is a god worthy of the Egyptians. What a prick. Number six is Menkuar, the pharaoh who refused death. Even though the title of pharaoh calls them undying and the pyramids are built to take them to the afterlife, you can't blame a person for still being fearful of what happens after they close their eyes for the last time. 25th century BC pharaoh Menkuar is the poster boy for that fear. An oracle once came to him and reportedly told him he only had six years left to live. Menkuar was terrified and decided to do everything he could to avoid it, even fool the gods. His biggest plan revolved around the idea that as long as night never came, a new day could never start. If a new day doesn't begin, time couldn't pass, so he couldn't die, right? Right. Anyways, on this basis, for the rest of his life, he lit up all the lamps he could and convinced himself it was always daytime. He would not sleep and force countless serfs to suffer with him this way. Every night, he stayed up drinking and celebrating the success until the day he died, because the gods will always have the last laugh. Sorostis, the genital king, is number five. Why genital king? Well, aside from being one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, he commemorated his success in a unique way, by setting up a big pit with a picture of someone's genitals on it. Male or female, he wasn't picky. He sent warships and troops to every corner of the known world and stretched his kingdom further than anyone else ever had, leaving these pillars on sites of every battleground. Aside from genitals, the pillars were of course ingrained with how he had subdued his enemies and how certain he was that the gods were in favor of his invade everyone policy. Quite cocky of him. The genitals depicted were based off of how valiantly their opponents had fought their invasion. Male depiction indicated that they were strong and brave soldiers. But the female depiction, well, it meant the word that we are all thinking. These pillars were left all across the continent and they stood the test of time. 1500 years later, after being erected, they still stand in series 
bacteria engraved with the genitals of failure. Look up the word spoil and you'll see number four is Pepe II. He was the longest ruling Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. The first half of this rule, he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half, nowhere close. In fact, it's the mark of the sharp decline of the old kingdom of Egypt as economic disarray was due to him virtually having no oversight. Pepe was made pharaoh in his early teen years, so naturally he got the spoiled brat treatment from mommy. A great example is shortly after being crowned, an explorer sent to trade and collect ivory, ebony, and other precious items had written him a letter reporting that he had met a dancing pygmy. Why? This is the greatest thing Pepe had ever heard! He had to see it for himself. So he demanded its transport back immediately and to abandon all precious materials they'd gathered in return for a high reward. Well, he got his dancing pygmy and he got pretty much everything he's ever asked for. He learned to accept that he was more important than other people. By the time he'd grown up, he was so corrupt that he made his serfs strip naked, cover themselves in honey, and follow him around just to keep the flies away. Number three is the klepto gaslighting Amasis. He's remembered as a total prick. Amasis actually made his way onto the throne after the current pharaoh had sent him to calm down a rebellion, but when he got there he realized the rebels had a pretty good chance of winning, so he decided to lead them instead. Amasis decided the best way to tell the king about his change of sides and a declaration of war was by lifting his leg, farting, and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He was a rampant alcoholic as well as a kleptomaniac. Apparently he would steal his friends' stuff put it in his own temples, and then try to convince them that they had never owned it in the first place. However, amongst all his bratty behavior, Amasis brought some major reform to oracles. One example actually comes from when he was a poor thief on the street. When he had been caught stealing, he'd been sent to stand in front of oracles who were supposedly be able to divine tell whether he was innocent or guilty. Well, once he was king, he remembered which oracles had pronounced him innocent of the crimes he had committed, and then punished for fraud. Because if they'd actually been able to speak to the gods, they would have known he was always guilty. Number two is cut Cutting down on crime, Actus Sains. Amasis wasn't tolerated for long and he was overthrown the way he'd done to his predecessor. This time the rebellion was led by the Ethiopian Actus Sains, who believed in a gentler approach to kinghood. Actus Sains fought for the crown literally because of a magic spell he'd heard about and also to deal with Egypt's criminals in a flashy new way, controlled exile. Every person who committed a crime he ruled would have their nose cut off and then they'd be sent off to the town he called Rhinoclora, literally the town of cut off noses. It was exclusively populated by these now noseless criminals struggling to survive in the harsh landscape, drinking dirty water and eating trash or the odd stray quail that came through. Something like this may have seemed harsh, but it was actually considered benevolence at the time. Roman chronologers of Rinacola, or Rincolora, whichever it's pronounced, wrote an example of how Actus Sains was actually considering a kindly manner towards his subjects. So keep that in mind when you're doing a comparison of now versus then. And in at number one is Akhenaten. This this pharaoh was so hated that the Egyptians themselves wiped his name out of history. Born Amenhotep, he changed his name to Ahak, I'm gonna call him Ak, in accordance with this radical monotheistic drive. His new name meant that he is of service to the Aten, in honor of what he believed to be the one true god, Aten, the sun god. Acted everything in the name of the sun god. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Amarnia, and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean Horizon of Aten, and then he ordered a new capital city be built there. He chose the site because it was uninhabited. It was not the property of anyone else except Aten. He moved an estimated 20,000 people into this developing city and forced them to build it. These people had to push through everything. Based on the bones found in the town's cemetery, more than two thirds of his workers broke a bone while they're working and a good one third of them broke their spines. Almost everyone was malnourished. When he enforced monotheism, Ak failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the national, socioeconomic, and cultural hubs. It was the gods' priests that oversaw the industries of agriculture and craftsmanship through their patronage and they who served as pillars of their communities. So by stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest recession and an entire empire nearly collapsed because of him. So it's no wonder after his death, Egypt immediately went back to polytheism and they also abandoned the new city he'd made them build. They destroyed his statues, his effigies, his monuments, and they removed him from their list of kings and history books. In fact, they did this so efficiently that we didn't really even know about him until his remains were found all alone in the city he'd forced his subjects to create. All right, so the Cambyses are up first. Cambius was the son of Cyrus the First and 
the succeeder of his father in Anshan as the king of Agistius of Media. According to the 5th century BC Greek historian Herodotus, Cambius married a daughter of Astidius, by whom he became the father of Cyrus II. Cambius II, aka Cyrus II, performed the ritual duties of the Babylonian king at the important New Year festival of 538 and of 530. Before Cyrus set out on his last campaign, he was appointed the regent in Babylon. That campaign was the conquest of Egypt, planned by Cyrus, and was a major achievement of Cambius' reign once captured. This is the lunatic who liked to torture animals for entertainment and notoriously killed the Apis bull to torment the Greeks who worshipped it. Cambius was traveling through Syria on his way back to Persia when he first heard reports of a revolt there. And then he died mysteriously in Syria in the summer of 522, either by his own hand or as the result of an accident. This is one of the few Persian families to have held the throne, the Xerxes line. First we have the granddaddy Xerxes I, or the Great as titled by the fifth Persian king. He was the son of Darius the Great and his reign lasted from 486 BC to 465 BC. He's well known in history for his attempted invasion of Greece and how later in the same year he was defeated in the Battle of Salamis which led him to flee his own kingdom. He's known as both a Persian ruler and a pharaoh as when he ruled Egypt it was also part of the Persian Empire. Little is known about the last years of Xerxes life. After his reversal in Greece he withdrew into himself and allowed himself to be drawn into his harem intrigues in which he was in fact only a pawn. Thus he disposed of his brother's entire family at the demand of the queen. He was assassinated by his own commander of the royal bodyguard forces. Another son, Artaxerxes I, succeeded in retaining power. Artaxerxes I was given the throne by the commander of the guard, Artabanus, who had killed Xerxes. It's fine though, because Xerxes Jr. got his daddy's lick back when he kills Arta about a month later. His reign, though generally peaceful, was disturbed by several insurrections, the first of which was the revolt of his brother. During his reign, Artaxerxes completed the Hall of 100 Columns at Persepolis, rebuilt the palace of Darius I at Susa after a fire, and Artaxerxes died of natural causes in 424 BCE, having ensured a peaceful succession by naming Xerxes II his legitimate heir. Xerxes II reigned for only a little over a month, however, before he was assassinated. Next is the Dossier line. Starting with Dossi Dajer from the Second Kingdom Egypt's Third Dynasty, he undertook the construction of the earliest important stone buildings in Egypt. His reign, which probably lasted 19 years, was marked by great technological innovation in the use of stone architecture. The innovative structure was a departure from the traditional use of mud bricks alongside stone. The greatest advance, however, was the completion of alteration of the shape of a monument from a flat-topped rectangular structure known as a mastaba to a six-stepped pyramid. This great character built the famous pyramid and set up the construction mechanisms of large buildings, paving the way for successors of their kingdom for even more daring constructions. The Pyramid of Dossier is the first pyramid in history of ancient Egypt and therefore potentially all of humanity. It is a degree pyramid that is at the center of a funerary complex of great importance. It's located in the necropolis of Saqqara. Sekhemet is probably the brother or eldest son of King Dossier. Little is known about this king since he ruled for only a few years. However, he erected a step pyramid at Saqqara and left behind a well-known rock inscription at the Wadi Makara. No pep in his servant steps for sure, it's Pepe. So Pepe the first kills the game. He does a great job ruling Egypt. He initiated the policy of, of intensive penetration of Nubia south of the first Nile cataract. Inscriptions record journeys southward early in his reign and fragments of vessels bearing the king's name were excavated in Karma. Meanwhile, Pepe the second is the longest running Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. He's also believed to be the youngest ruler ever in Egyptian history. Pepe the second was the son of Pepe the first, obviously, and was born late into his father's reign. While he was still very young, he succeeded his half-brother Marine, who died at an early age. His mother served as regent for a number of years, and the old group of officials serving the royal family maintained the kingdom's stability. During the first half of his rule, he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half? 
nowhere close. You see a sharp decline of the old kingdom as economic disarray is caused by him virtually having no oversight. Powerful provincial nobles drew talent away from the capital and because of the unusually long reign of the king, Egypt had a senile ruler when it needed vigorous leadership. Those of Pepe's children who survived him had brief ephemeral reigns and failed to cope with the political and economic crisis that arose as the sixth dynasty ended. His tomb may be more famous than he is, Menkures. His tomb, the Pyramid of Menkure, is one of three pyramids of Giza, alongside his statue triads that show the king together with his wives and various deities. It's the smallest of the three main pyramids of Giza, just 62 meters tall, but has one of the most complex and best preserved structures. He had two wives, both are his sisters naturally, and they didn't have much luck with sons at first. Three in total and one daughter. At his death, his successor, his son, Shafaskek, completed the stonework walls of the mortuary temple in brick. Menaku was not succeeded by his eldest son, who actually predeceased him, but rather by Shepsake, a younger son. Shepsake built a monumental mastaba at the South Accra and was the only kingdom ruler to not build a pyramid. This family's work, especially the Great Pyramids, show a great mastery of monumental stoneworking. Individual blocks were larger, colossal, and were extremely accurately fitted. They were good, and then they were great, and then they were absolute trash. The Amenhotep. All right, so on the top of the bucket, we got Amen one He's the great-great-granddaddy. He effectively extended Egypt's boundaries into Nubia. Next is great-granddaddy Amen the second who was an army leader with famous archery and battle skills. Supposedly, he was able to shoot arrows straight through a thick of copper plates. His athletic ability was incredible, and he was known to have rowed a ship faster than 200 of Egypt's strongest navy men. Next is granddaddy Amen the third who built himself endless monuments and temples. Perhaps his most famous construction was the Temple of Luxor in Thebes. This temple has become one of the grandest and most famous temples in Egypt. His diplomatic relations allowed art and culture to flourish, and his building projects are legendary. And then there's disastrous daddy Akhenaten, or Amen the fourth. This nutcase was obsessed with the sun god Atum and changed his name, appearance, politics, lifestyle, anything he could to feel closer to his lord. This pharaoh was so hated that Egyptians themselves wiped his name from their history. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Armania and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean the horizon of Aten and then ordered a new capital city be built there, moving an estimated 20,000 people over to make it. When he enforced monotheism, Og failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the nation's socioeconomic cultural hubs, who was the god priest that oversaw all of their industries. So without them, those pillars of the communities were just gone. And stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest reception. And then we've got the bottom of the bucket. We have our boy Tukmahad, aka King Tut, who by his third year changed his name to Tukmahad and issued decree restoring temples, images, personnel, and privileges of the old gods to undo what his dad had done. He also began the protracted process of restoring the sacred shrines of Amun, which had been severely damaged during his father's rule. No prescription or persecution of Atan, though, Akmahan's god, was undertaken, and royal vineyards and regiments of the army were still named after Atan. Tukmahad unexpectedly died in his 19th year. Whatever the case, he died without designating an heir. This is another four-part family tree. First, great-granddaddy Snerfu founds the fourth dynasty and marries the daughter of the last pharaoh of the third empire, thus helped to solidify his possession as the pharaoh of the new dynasty, as well as secure Khufu's place in the line of succession. Meanwhile, his son, who becomes granddaddy Khufu, pops out the great pyramid of Giza, one of the seven wonders of the world. Apparently, we were so impressed by this that we forgot to write anything else about him or why he did this because we know very little about Khufu. We know he reigned 23 years between 2500 and 2566, and we know he married his sister. Shocker. Khufu traded for highly rare items, prizing both construction materials and precious materials like copper and turquoise, and so he developed the mining industry in Egypt. Limestone and granite were also quarried in vast amounts for rather large building projects that he was working on. Built over a period of 27 years, the Great Pyramid is undoubtedly Khufu's greatest legacy. Khufu's children include nine sons and six daughters, including Defreya and Khafri, who would both become pharaohs following his death. When in power, his son Defreya moved eight kilometers north of Giza and established a new necropolis on a higher leveled ground. Defreya's pyramid was quarried for its stone and as such, there's very little of it left standing today. Meanwhile, the underson Khafri succeeded the short-lived Radifi and married his sister and two other queens who were probably his sisters. Best known for his pyramid, 
Pyramid, one of the three Great Pyramids of Giza, and also best known for the Sphinx, which bears his likeness on its face. And who else but the Ramses clan? The Ramses the first gets the throne in a super uneventful way. He was friends and confidant to the former pharaoh who didn't have a single heir. Then Ramses spent all of his free time marrying all four of his daughters. Meanwhile, his son, Seti the first, led a great army of 60,000 men and fought in many battles north of Palestine and Syria. King Ramses the second, son of Seti the first, was able to finish his father's work by beating the Hittite army in battle of Kadesh and creating the first documented peace treaty in history. Ramses the second went on to declare himself a god and rule Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is insane in an era where life expectancy was 30. But before getting to that ripe old age, Ramses spent any free time he had chasing anything with two feet in a heartbeat, enough to sire 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his own sons, leaving no heir. They're back again, the Ptolemies. People loved learning about this batch of literal bastards in the recent top 10 powerful families in history you didn't want to mess with video. Apparently y'all like when I'm doing tongue twisters. For those who don't know why this family could be a tongue twister, an important note is that they always recycled the family names, men always named Platonomy, and women always named Cleopatra or Berenice. They also happen to really, really, really take the old Egyptian ideology of royals only being with other royals a little too seriously. What's created is a massive family tree, one full of manipulation contempt, scandal, and brash killings. While the Platonomy started off strong, building the Library of Alexandria, compiled a star catalog and the earliest surviving table of trigonomic function, and establishing mathematically that an object is and its mirror image must make an equal angles to be a mirror. After the fourth, however, the family became like the Kardashians, talentless and messy. They took up everybody's time, but nobody stopped the free entertainment. So like last time, let me limber up and I'll run us through some of the notorious BS. Platonomy killed his mother who had killed her husband who was having a love affair with her mother and then married his sister Aronso III who was then later killed after Platonomy IV died. Platonomy XII annoyed his children so much, particularly his daughter Berenice IV, that they rebelled against him and drove him from Egypt. Berenice IV ruled briefly. She probably had her sister killed. She certainly had her husband strangled who wasn't a family member. She was beheaded on the orders of her father. Platonomy XII. Platonomy 14 was the younger brother of Cleopatra 7, that's the Mark Antony one, and possibly poisoned by that same sister. Platonomy 7 was then killed by his uncle, the next Platonomy 8, at a wedding feast, or he may have been killed by his own father, Platonomy 4. Scholars disagree. It's so messy, my mouth's so dry. Let's go on to the next one. Our favorite bearded lady was part of this family. It's the Thutmos line. Granddaddy Thutmos the first became king after Amenthal died without an heir. Probably one of the previous monarchs generals, he came to the throne around age 40 and is thought to have ruled for little over 10 years. Historians have generally described Thomas II as a frail and ineffectual, just the sort of person that a purposely shrewish hapshaput could push around. Public monuments, however, depict a dutiful hapshaput standing appropriately next to her husband. Wife to Tut II, Hapshaput failed in the more important duty of producing a son. So when Thut II died young in 1497, yet again, the throne went to a harem child. Duly named Thutmos III, Three, this child was destined to become one of the great warrior kings of Egypt, but at the time of his father's death, he was too young to take the rule. As widow, Hat became regent leader until Thut came of age. Within a few years, however, she proclaimed herself pharaoh, a vile absurd. And the seven years past that point, she'd taken up cross-dressing imagery. Once depicted as slim and graceful queen, is now full-blown, flail and crook wielding king with the broad bare chest of a man and the ferric false beard, but also still long flowing hair and feminine feet. Features. Upon Hat's death in 1458, her stepson, then likely in his early 20s, finally ascended to the throne. Thutmose III was a skilled warrior who brought Egypt's empire to the zenith of its power by conquering all of Syria and crossing the Euphrates. The spoils from his many wars made Thutmose III the richest man in the world. His military accomplishments are recorded on the numerous monuments he built himself. Legal bet. The best example of this is one way ticket. If you've watched some of our other pharaoh videos before, you may know the reason their tombs are so packed full of art and treasure, but also carriages and beds and forks and snacks. Genuinely just random living equipment is because the Egyptians ran on the belief that after death, you continued to live life. So you need all the stuff that you had in your regular life if you wanted to maintain your comfort and not have to rebuy or rebuild everything. So if you're an everyday person, yeah, they may toss your toothbrush and your teddy bear in there, but pharaohs were used to a more personal, larger commodity. People, servants and concubines and serfs 
so all of these people were considered possessions as well. So if the pharaoh died for a super long time, they'd quite literally mass kill his whole staff and toss him down there in his tomb. For example, one of the very first rulers, King Aha, supposedly died after being gored to death by a hippo. To accompany Aha to the afterlife, some courtiers, retainers, and slaves downed poison and were buried with him. Sometimes, if the rumor is true, these peoples would also simply be sealed into the tombs alive. Fights to say crime, very big crime, very big crime, 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 crime. While that wasn't a big deal then, however, the Trishrata agreement violations was. Trishrata, the king of Mitadani, who was another close ally of Egypt's, had given his daughter's hand in marriage to Akinsaten, the father of Amenhotep, aka King Tut. Upon his father's death, the young pharaoh married the Mitadani princess as well, making her one of the lesser wives. Let's be real, Nefertiti had homeboy's heart, soul, and boys in a chokehold. Trishrata sent Akhenaten many letters to protest the fact that he never received the agreed upon bride price of solid gold statues and instead had only been sent gold plated wooden ones. Cheapos. The pharaohs didn't avoid all diplomatic matters, just ones they didn't personally entrust him. His attention was primarily focused on religious reform and life within his palace. This Persian pharaoh was a known prick and animal hater. The Persian son of Cyrus the Great, after Cambius' nation conquered Egypt though, he was put in charge of that country. And so he was the ruler of Egypt and apparently someone who hated animals. This is the psycho who strapped cats onto shields to gain entry into Egypt, put on fights between lion cubs and puppies, and once killed the sacred apis bull, a literal crime in ancient Egypt punishable by death. When Cambyses returned to Memphis after an unsuccessful military campaign in the south, Apis' new reincarnation happened to appear in Egypt the same day, which is a massive call of celebration. When Apis appears, the Egyptians all at once don their best clothes and they hold a festival. Seeing this, Cambyses is convinced they're celebrating his misfortunes, so he summoned the rulers of Memphis and demanded to know why the Egyptians were behaving this way. They answered that a god had appeared and it was custom for Egyptians to rejoice that occasion? Cambyses is unconvinced though and claims they're lying and has them put to death. He then next summons the priests who told him the same thing when he asked. He replied that if a tame god had come to Egypt, he would know about it. Then he ordered the priests bring Apis before him, which they stupidly do. When the priests lead him in, Cambyses draws his dagger and stabs the bull. Laughing at their screams of horror, he said to the priest, are these your gods, fools of flesh and blood who can feel the bite of iron? This is a fitting god for Egyptians, but I will teach you to make a laughing stock of me. He then ordered all the priests swift and any other Egyptians celebrating to be killed. So the festival ended and the priests were punished and Apis lay in the temple until it died and they had to secretly bury it. This was arguably kind of a crime, kind of not. It's Cleopatra, sibling annihilator. And she is nowhere near the only one. Egyptian pharaohs loved to smoke their own siblings, kids, nephews, to, to ensure any kind of throne claim. That's why, yeah, it was a crime, but who's gonna do something about that, and what can you do that won't make you the next coup victim yourself? Power grabs and murder plots were as much a Ptolematic tradition as inter-sibling marriage, and Cleopatra and her brothers and sisters were no different. Her first sibling husband, Ptolemy the bajillions, ran her out of Egypt after she tried to take sole possession of the throne, and then the pair later faced off in a civil war that she won by shacking up with Uncle Caesar. Ptolemy then drowned in the Nile. Following the war, Cleopatra married her younger brother, and she is believed to have killed him not long after as the marriage was just to ensure her and Caesar's son, Caesarian, was next in line. In 41 BC, she also engineered the death of her sister, Aronso, who was considered a rival to the throne. See, I'd say a bunch of killing coups. That's a crime. Nothing like a klepto gaslighter king, though. Amasis' crime was literally being a petty thief. Absolutely zero yard cred for that one. Dude was a raging alcoholic, nympho, and made it to the throne by being sent to calm down a rebellion, but instead chose to join it and lead it, overthrowing the pharaoh and earning him his throne. Ever a master of tact, he sent the king his declaration of war by actually lifting his leg and farting and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He's that guy. But what was most hilarious, at least to me, was the fact he's a kleptomaniac that would steal his friend's stuff, then put it in his house, invite those friends over, intentionally bring them to the room where the item was, and then try to convince them that they'd never owned it in the first place once they'd seen it. This is the single most frat boy personality I've come across in ancient times anywhere, and it's glad to know that it actually does come from somewhere. By making religion illegal, he was defying the laws of the gods, Akhenaten's monotheism. Intentionally erased from history until the 19th century, Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten established the first known monotheistic religion.
religion called Atanism, which was rediscovered in the late 18th century and integrated by the 19th and 20th centuries religious philosophers into the histories of the three Abrahamic religions. During Akhenaten's first years as pharaoh, he did recognize the existence of other gods, even though Aten was his primary patron deity. There exists iconography from early Akhenaten's reign where he was still Amenhotun of Aten, and that includes images of the other solar gods. However, those scenes of Aten sharing space with other gods soon disappear in later depictions, and some of these iconographs of Aten alongside other deities are defaced a few years later after their creation. Additionally, any mention of Akhenaten's old name, Amenhotun, was also hacked out. Akhenaten would eventually officially proclaim that Aten was the one and only god, and he condemned the worship and or acknowledgement of any other deity, going so as far as to remove their names and effigies. This actually led to Ak's condemnation of memory, a practice reserved for scrubbing unlikable people from history. By imposing these laws, he defied the universe's laws and those unspoken of freedom of religion in them. Womp womp, y'all ain't gonna like this one. It's Puppy Mills. Very legal, as they should be. Your reminder to please go to the SPCA and a charity and adopt one of those adult animals or rescued baby animals rather than financially feed a puppy or kitten male because you want a fancy breed. But back in ancient Egypt, they were not only incredibly necessary, but also, well, come a dog. Is it okay to use that right now? In Saqqara, researchers have discovered burial sites filled with a huge number of mummified animals, nearly 8 million of them, and most of them are dogs. The catacomb in particular is one dedicated to the jackal-headed god Anubis, who represents the afterlife. Archaeologist and Egyptologist Salma Ikram writes that the animal mummification began in ancient Egypt to allow beloved pets to go on to the afterlife as well, to provide food in the afterlife, and to act as offerings to a particular god. Nowadays people go to church and they light a candle when they wanted some godly handouts, but the Egyptians were in for the long haul. One little flame isn't enough, so instead they would offer a mummified dog. To get a mummified dog, well, Ikram says the huge number of mummified dogs implies, if not completely confirms, the existence of ancient Egyptian puppy mills. As quote, you don't get 8 million mummies without having puppy farms, and some of these dogs were killed deliberately so that they could be offered. So for us, that really seems heartless, but for the Egyptians, they felt that the dogs were going straight up to join the eternal pack with Anubis, and so they were going off to a better thing. 2,000 years later, Alex is facing his crimes. During his stay in Egypt, Alexander the Great was proclaimed the new pharaoh. He received historic titles associated with the position, such as the son of Ra and beloved of Amun. Whether Alexander also received the elaborate coronation ceremony at Memphis, however, is debated. But what won't be is him being on this list. Fight me all. Although he was in control of Persia by 330 BC, a very drunk and very angry, he stood stripped royal treasuries as he went through the country and captured Persia's capital, Persepolis, burning it to the ground in a final act of revenge against Persia with all the treasures inside. Alexander the Great's Macedonian army then pillaged the city, destroyed the palace complex, killed almost every single civilian, and then violated and stole the women. So, 2,377 years later, on the 26th of October 2022, Alexander the Great stood trial for war crimes at the UK Supreme Court. He was charged with four count of violation of laws and customs of war during the raising and conquest of Persepolis. The prosecution argued that Alexander was a war criminal who committed atrocities at Persepolis as a deliberate political act. The defense argued that the burning of Persepolis was not politically motivated, rather it was merely a tragic consequence of his drunken behavior. And shockingly, the jury acquitted him on all four counts of war crimes. The verdict surprised Lord Legat, the Supreme Court justice presiding, after the jury chose to judge the defendant by the standards of his own time rather than the modern customs of war in the annual Classics for All moot trial. I cannot help but feel some regret that you found deliberate extermination and enslavement not to be war crimes, but so be it, Legat said. Now for something that was a Grecian no, but in Egypt it's a yeah, sibling relations. So it, the Egyptian pharaohs wouldn't be breaking any crimes, but with the Polytamic dynasty when they came in, they were Macedonian Greeks from a land where it was very much a crime to be doing some stuff with your siblings. It's also very much a crime by today's standards everywhere but Alabama. So The Ptolemies adopted this practice from the Egyptians whom they'd conquered, although this would ironically exclude the native Egyptians. The tradition of 
sibling marriages appears to have begun with Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who married his older sister Arsenio II. The epithet Philadelphus actually means sibling lover, but they kept it clean. It wasn't until the union of Ptolemy III and Arsenio III that this custom of interfamily marriage resulted in the first birth of an heir. All earlier heirs to the Egyptian throne in the Ptolemaic dynasty had been from the side wives. As noted by historian Sheila L. Agar, the Greeks clearly believed that interfamily relations were repugnant not only to the gods, but to all right thinking individuals. Given that the Greek literature sees it as one of the greatest taboos, things did not turn out well for Oedipus after all. There has been a protracted scholarly debate as to why the Ptolemies engaged in it. One of the primary explanations is they were influenced by the local culture. However, the practice of sibling marriage may have also bolstered their legitimacy as authentic pharaohs in the eyes of their Egyptian subjects. Despite this, even though other Greek families had moved to Egypt were also marrying cousins, there is a tendency to blame the Egyptians for the Ptolematic you know, issue. Now, it, the insane way in which Cleo learned the toxic limits. Alexandria became a prestigious center of learning and the first medical center of the ancient world. As the last member of the Ptolematic dynasty, Cleopatra inherited the throne, but also the great inclination of the Ptolemies towards medicine and science. Attracted by knowledge of venoms and poison, Cleopatra began to test them on condemned prisoners to see the different reactions produced in the body and found toxic limitations. By tricking or directly for Forcing the prisoners into testing these poisons and mixes, Cleo learned oral poisons would cause disturbances such as painful spasms, nausea, abdominal cramps, and slow ends. She even had set snakes on prisoners in order to compare the major effects of venomous snake bites caused by the various species in Egypt, such as vipers or elephants. It has been said that Cleopatra used the cobra to take her own life because it would also make sense in some Egyptian mythology, being associated with the sacred uraeus worn by the pharaohs. How However, there are several problems with this theory, and some scholars argue when she decided to take her life using the information from testing these poisons, she would use a poison that would make sense, that given the possibility to choose the best one, to have a quick and relatively pain-free death. We're gonna start with the latest and the greatest. Number 10 is the latest Saqqara discoveries. So on January 26th of 2023, after a year-long excavation of the notorious Saqqara necropolis, two ancient tombs that date back to the 5th and 6th dynasty of the Old Kingdom are unveiled to the public. Zahi Hawass, who isn't my favorite person to cite, gave a statement on one of the mummies found. Kanohe de Defe was a inspector of officials, supervisor of nobles, and a priest in the pyramid complex of Unas. Mehdi had many titles, one of them being the Keeper of Secrets, which is a title you'll hear again later in this video. This would also be a great time to take a second and subscribe to The Hive if you're a fan of discoveries such as these. Also found was a stone sarcophagus with a mummified man named Fatek, but the most important of the dust the corpse is found was a gold leaf covered mummy. Hekashepis was found down a 15 meter burial shaft inside a large rectangular limestone sarcophagus. While other mummies have been found with this unusual coding choice, Hekashepis gets to take seniority. This mummy is the oldest complete mummy covered in gold, Hawass said in an interview having led the excavation himself. The excavation team also found dozens of other valuable artifacts including statues, some of which still have their original paint intact, as well as amulets, coins, earrings, Rings, rings, and tablets, all of which are currently being displayed at the Step Pyramid of Hauser in Saqqara. Number nine is the tomb special of collecting crocs. Archaeologists excavating the Theban necropolis in Egypt made an extraordinary but unusual discovery, which was announced on December 20th of 2022. Nine crocodile heads placed inside two tombs belonging to high-ranking nobles. Archaeologist Patrick Chudzik told the Newsweek that the discovery was the first of its kind, as crocodile remains have never been discovered inside the tombs of Egypt, despite usually being found inside of temples or special catacombs. Dr. Chudzik explains in our case, things are different. Firstly, only the heads and not the entire bodies of these Nile reptiles have been, have been deposited in these tombs where we work. Secondly, they were not mummified, only wrapped in linen. There is a significant difference in this and no preservatives were used. Finally, the remains were found in the tombs of humans, not catacombs of sacred animals. The tombs belong to two top officials during the reign of the pharaoh Nehefetre, Mentohalpet II. One being the Chancellor Cheti, a high official, but the occupant of the second tomb is actually still anonymous to us. Placing of the crocodile heads in the tombs, according to Dr. Chudzik, certainly was unusual, but not entirely unprecedented. He believes that earlier researchers paid scant attention to such finds
designs that depict cultural practices but weren't treasures, stating that its likely similar offerings had been placed in quite a few other tombs of rich individuals, but those offerings were discarded by the earlier researchers who discovered them. Number 8 is about the Ramesid Cemetery. So in April of 2023, the joint Dutch-Italian archaeological mission of the Saqqara archaeological site discovered the tomb of a person called Banhishias from the Ramesid period, the chief of servant of the tomb of a ten. Alongside his tomb was the discovery of four small chapels, reinforcing the previous theories that suggest the reuse of the space between the tombs of the 18th dynasty in later eras and the constructions of tombs and chapels in that area during the Ramesid period of Egypt. The cemetery is a self-contained temple, having its own entrance and inner courtyard as well as an underground burial chamber. Oddly, out of two out of those four chapels I mentioned were in dedication of a person that they don't recognize called Yo-Yo. Endless inscriptions and scenes on the walls are distinguished by their accuracy and quality of detail. One in particular shows a scene of funerary procession of Yo-Yo and the process of reviving his mummy again in the hereafter to live in the afterlife as a god, in addition to a scene depicting the cow goddess Hathor and a boat of the god Sekera, the god of the underworld. Inside the tomb, the mission found a Stella picturing of Banhasi and his wife Baya, the singer of Amun, before a table of sacrifice and several drawings of priests and animals. While some have warriors, others have the terracotta inscriptions, which is number seven. The Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and, Inqui and Antiquities announced another discovery in Saqqara, March 17th, 2022. As the title of the video reveals, it's very obviously tombs, specifically five of them. All burials date to either Old Kingdom or the first transition slash intermediate period, roughly 4,700 to 4,000 years ago. All belong to top officials and dignitaries from respective time periods and are in good state of preservation. Eity, one of the top nobles of the court, had a well-defined pathway leading to his burial room with the walls adorned with engraved pictures of many funeral scenes painted in bright terracotta and sandstone. Artistically, the colors of the paintings are considered royal colors by officials. Grave number two belonged to the wife of a man named Yart. Meanwhile, grave number three belonged to a person named Bobby Fadahafe, who used to occupy several important court positions, namely supervisor of the great house, the chanting priest, and the cleaner of the house. The fifth cemetery is a man called Hanu, who had many titles, such as the mayor. And the sixth grave, however, is the most interesting of them, as it has the archaeologist a little giddy. A woman called Betty, who was responsible for the king's makeup, appearance, and dressing, and was buried with tons of her cosmetic tools. Allegedly, she is also a priestess of Hathor, who's the goddess of love, beauty, music, fertility, and pleasure. You want to hear something crazy? Number six is how they cracked open a tomb and found a hundred sealed coffins. It was announced on the 14th of November 2020. It's the largest find of that year. It's a hundred sealed coffins and over 40 statues alongside hundreds of mixed artifacts. Naturally, they're discovered at the Saqqara necropolis and carbon dating tells us that the items date back to the Ptolematic dynasty that ruled Egypt for some 300 years from about 320 BC to 30 BC and the late period. The coffins were found inside a burial shaft that had not been opened at all for 2,500 years. The preliminary studies revealed quickly that most of these coffins belonged to 26 dynasty priests, top officials, and elites. A number of wooden statues and colored gilded masks were also found, all in really great condition, and 28 of the statuettes are Pates Sokar, the main god of the Saqqara necropolis, but there's one very special and unusual statue in this tomb, a bronze statue of the god Nefreta. The statue is inlaid with valuable precious stones. We're talking red agate, turquoise, jade, and lupus lazuli. It is 35 centimeters tall and has the name of its owner, Badia Munis, engraved in its base like Andy in Toy Story. I mentioned telling y'all about another keeper of the secret, so that's exactly what number five will be. This impressive tomb complex belonged to Kedes, a priest and official who was once the most powerful in Egypt Egypt, aside from the pharaoh, of course. It was found during an excavation of an unfinished pyramid that's adjacent to two extensive necropolises, but the identity of the builder or even the name of the unfinished site is still unknown. On a mission to gain that information, the Czech team were working on the site for only two weeks when they made their remarkable and unexpected discovery. The burial complex contains a tomb, but also a series of other rooms, and one held a cult chapel, which serves as a magnificent example of Old Kingdom architecture. In the tomb room, however, there's a limestone Coffin and a statue of Kedes, which has been somewhat miraculously preserved in its original location, according to the Czech Institute of Egyptology's report. It even still had some of its original paint. So, the 
statue is also a source of context in the tomb, revealing the name of Keres and his many titles for us. Based on the inscriptions from the tomb, he was also the sole friend of the pharaoh. This tomb has provided experts with many new insights on the 5th dynasty era. The discovery of the statue in the tomb was dramatic, as it proved an old kingdom at least. They did place statues of the dead in their own tombs. Sadly, this is one of those times where grave goods were looted centuries ago, so not much else remains. For number 4, we'll learn about ancient Photoshop. Thanks to new x-ray scanning methods, as announced July 13th of 2022, we now know that some of the pharaoh's paintings have been subtly edited over time. Traditionally, the analysis of ancient Egyptian paintings has been conducted in controlled laboratory environments or museum premises. This new study has instead pioneered a groundbreaking approach. Instead of taking the painting to the lab, bring the lab to the painting. You preserve history, you aren't stealing crap you shouldn't, and nobody gets cursed for tampering. I see nothing but wins here. So the findings focused on two paintings from the Ramesside period, which were discovered in tomb chapels located near the Theban necropolis. Through the application of x-ray technology, the team scanned specifically a painting of Ramesses II, unveiling hidden details imperceivable to the naked eye. Previously, scholars speculated the painting depicted the pharaoh grieving the loss of his father. However, the latest scan of the portrait challenges the interpretation as Ramesses can be seen beneath a cult canopy before the enthroned Ptah. Additionally, there's adjustments to the crown and other royal items in the portrait of Ramesses II, and he's currently depicted wearing a Wexit collar, which was not historically used during his reign. Underneath that new layer of paint is the original painting of a Shebu collar. These modifications likely reflect shifts in the symbolic significance of these elements over time. This finding suggests that ancient Egyptians continuously adapted their artistic expressions to convey evolving cultural and religious ideologies even when pharaohs had passed. This next tomb is a bit more recent and a bit more strange. Number 3 is Pet Cemetery. May 28th of 2023 marked the completion of the 6th excavation season in the Saqqara. They had announced their latest finding, two humans and an animal embalming workshop, as well as two tombs of notable officials and their wives, all conjoined together. According to the press release from the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, the structures date back to the 30th pharaonic dynasty to the Ptolematic period around 2400 years ago. The newest discovered animal embalming workshop was constructed with mud and limestone floors. A number of the rooms and halls were found to contain a large number of pottery, linen, animal embroidery, and different animal burials. Researchers found one room stockpiled with bronze tools used specifically for animal mummification processes and varying sizes of stone beds used to mummify the most sacred of animals. And then they found the similar room but for humans. So large stone beds ended in gutters to facilitate the mummification process with the collection of clay pots nearby to hold entrails and organs, as well as a collection of instruments and ritual vessels. Analysis later determined that the chemical residues discovered in these tombs were a mixture of fragrant or antiseptic oils, tars, and resins, according to the ministry. When all of these paints and resins are brought together, including the damar tree resin and the enmi oil, the researchers figured out, quite unusually, that the raw materials were imported from Asia and other regions of Africa. How did we manage to find a queen we didn't know we lost? but we're still out searching for Nefertiti and Cleopatra. Irony of life. Number two is unearthed but unknown. What are the chances that on the 100 year anniversary of unearthing King Tut's tomb, archaeologists discovered hundreds of tombs and mummies buried in Giza? This genuinely happened on November 4th of 2022, and even crazier, it's attached to a pyramid of a never before known ancient Egyptian queen. So to quote Zahi Hawass, most burials known in the Saqqara previously were either from the Old Kingdom or Late Period. Now we have 22 interconnected shafts ranging 30 to 60 feet, all with new kingdom burials, aka this is an unusual but incredible find. Buried within these shafts, archaeologists found huge limestone sarcophagus alongside 300 beautiful coffins, Hwas said. The coffins have individual faces, each one unique, distinguishing between men and women, and are decorated with scenes from the Book of the Dead. Each coffin also has the name of the deceased and often shows the four sons of Horus who protected the organs of the deceased. This shows that mummification reached its peak in the New Kingdom, still quoting Hawass. Some coffins have two lids, and most amazing coffins so far had the mask of a woman made completely of solid gold. In addition, they found a pyramid commemorating a previously unknown queen. We have since discovered that her name was Neith, and she had never before been known from historical record. It is amazing to literally rewrite what we know of history, adding a new queen to our records. While much of the life of the real Queen Neith still remains unknown, the discovery of her pyramid is likely to provide significant insight into her role. 
cool. This tomb's discovery was far grander than that of Tut's, yet war overshadowed its discovery, making it back page news. Well, today it gets its rightful attention as number one. It's the Silver Pharaoh. To start some context, in ancient Egyptian culture, gold was considered the flesh of the gods, while silver was believed to be their bones. Gold was abundant in ancient Egypt, making silver more valuable as it had to be imported from Western Asia and the Mediterranean. Okay, now story time. So amidst the chaos of the Second World War in Western Europe, a French archaeologist found the world's most fabulous tomb. At the world's worst time, as said, the discovery is largely overshadowed despite its magnitude, somewhat understandably as European societies preoccupied with escalating conflict. What amped the magnitude of this find was that the pharaoh was entombed in a solid silver coffin, a massive testament to immense wealth and power that we've never seen in another Egyptian tomb since. Bonus points for the silver anthropod coffin being found in a pink granite coffin, which in turn was encased within a plain granite sarcophagus. Unlike Tut's body, however, Montet only ever found a pile of bones, black dust, and funerary items like the gold mummy board and a spectacular gold mask that would have covered the pharaoh's face and given Tut's a run for his mummy. Ha, <laughs> get it? This loss sadly was from groundwater seeping in through to the mummy and most of the wooden items entombed also deteriorated over time. Nonetheless, Montet was able to recover several non-perishable items such as canopic jars and shabatis, along with precious objects inside the sarcophagus, treasures that rival Tut's in their worth. When considering the wealth of the objects found in Susinna's tomb, along with the duration of his reign, it appears that a reassessment of the situation in Egypt during the Third Intermediate Period, or at least during the reign of Sunnisid, the Silver Pharaoh, is long overdue. 